Some people are just always looking for a new project. Well, Carl Graham Fisher took that philosophy to the extreme. He started his first business at the age of 17 and from there went from massive project to massive project, consistently finding success in unexpected places through a combination of grit, ingenuity, and determination. He helped to start the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, to build the first interstate highways in America, and to build the city of Miami Beach. And yet, despite his considerable talents, his fortune would eventually be lost due to a series of unfortunate events. His name is not well known today, but by the people who do remember his accomplishments, he's generally considered to be a promotional genius, once described by the Indianapolis Star as the P.T. Barnum of the automobile age. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Carl Fisher was born in Greensburg, Indiana in 1874. His father, Albert, suffering from alcoholism, left the family when Carl was still a child and his mother, Ida, struggled to support Carl and his brothers. He struggled in school thanks to a severe astigmatism and left school at age 12 to support the family. He held a series of jobs afterwards and showed a knack for promotion early on when he displayed a banner for the grocery store he worked at while sledding down a steep hill. He developed salesmanship selling candy, peanuts, books, and even shining shoes as a news butcher in Indianapolis. At 17, he and his brothers opened up a bicycle repair shop in Indianapolis, just in time for a bicycle boom. He was an excellent mechanic, but an even better rider, and he did stunts and competed in races across the region. He was already a master salesman. You couldn't be with him more than half a minute without feeling that life was a pretty damn exciting position, said one friend. Without an invitation, he walked into the office of one of the nation's top bicycle manufacturers and walked out with a dealership and 120 bicycles to sell on consignment. In the growing town of Indianapolis, Carl made his mark by showing a brilliant knack for promotion. He rode a 20-foot tall bicycle down a crowded city street, strung a tightrope across the street and rode a bike across it, and even advertised that he was going to throw a bike off the tallest building in the city. And the police told him that if he'd try it, he'd be arrested. So he announced a time, and when the police waited for him to arrive, he threw the bike off at the appointed time. He'd spent the night on top of the building with the bike. His business thrived. But bigger things were already on the horizon. In 1898, he became one of the first people in Indianapolis to own an automobile when he imported a two and a half horsepower motor tricycle. By 1900, his bicycle dealership had become an automobile dealership, one of the first in the country. To prove that automobiles were durable, he pushed one off a building and then got in it and drove it away. He was constantly coming up with new ideas, something he called a hen falling off and then coming up with ways to turn those ideas into reality. And he still loved racing, only now he could go much faster. He toured the Midwest with some friends, billed as the Big Racing Four. He set a world record for two miles in just over two minutes in a race in Chicago. Astonishingly, he only got his first pair of glasses when he was 31. But this was a time before racetracks, and racing was dangerous. In one race, his brakes failed, and his car plowed into the stands, killing and injuring 14 spectators. One of Carl's first safety innovations was to support Percy Avery's patented acetylene cylinders, which could provide light to cars, then far too dangerous to drive at night. He and some partners started a new company and called the invention the Presto Light. Though dangerous and explosive, their initial factory exploded and blew up the sauerkraut factory next door, the vehicle headlines became standard on nearly all cars. In 1913, Carl and his partners sold the company to Union Carbide for $9 million dollars nearly a quarter billion in 2020 dollars when adjusted for inflation. In 1908, he strapped a Stoddard Dayton car to a balloon. Some 5,000 people watched the balloon pick up the car with ease. He was to drive the car away after they landed, but to make it fly, he had had the vehicle's engine removed. His brother met him when they landed with an identical car, which was the one that he did drive away. It was simple, yet no one seemed to figure it out, Carl said. The publicity for the stunt went national, and he advertised that Stoddard Dayton was the first car to fly over Indianapolis. It should be your first car. On a personal note, flying over the city was the first time Jane Watts, soon to be his first wife, ever saw him. Like other car owners of the time, Carl was finding that cars weren't very reliable. Cars would often overheat or break down only miles off the showroom floors, and fixing them was just part of owning one. There ought to be a track to test these cars before the public gets them, he said. He'd also seen the greater reliability of European cars, and after watching a race in Europe in which only one American car even finished, and in last place, he became convinced that competitive racing improved the cars. There was no place in America to test cars over a continuous drive of more than two miles. He made up my mind then to build a speedway where cars could run a thousand miles in a test, if necessary. 
To convince American automakers a track was necessary, he gave them a stark warning. European companies could take over the entire American market any time they decide to export cars in sufficient quantity. You'll learn ten times as much racing against each other as you will from listening to the complaints, he said, and advocated for a big new racetrack designed for automobiles. Within weeks, the Indianapolis Automobile Racing Association was formed. His idea was for a three-mile track which banked curves that he had seen in England. When he found a good location near Indianapolis, he got a deal to buy it. He brought in his friend and business partner in Presto Light, Jim Allison, and then invited three others. Arthur Newby of the National Motor Vehicle Company, Frank Wheeler of the Wheeler Shebler Carburetor Company, and Stoughton Fletcher, a banker. Fletcher dropped out because his bank thought a racetrack wasn't a good investment for his conservative reputation. Some of these conservative high society types called Fisher and Allison poor boys with big ideas. It was no matter. Allison and Fisher took up his shares and incorporated the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Company on February 9, 1909. That summer they held balloon races before a crushed gravel track was even finished. The work crews worked 24 hours a day getting ready for motorcycle championships in August. The track was barely ready in time, but the motorcyclists didn't like the track, which developed potholes quickly. In the first car race a week later, five people died in accidents. Carl pivoted to buying three million bricks to make the track safe, giving the track its famous nickname, the Brickyard. Success was still mixed the next year, and the founders decided to hold just a single race a year, the International 500 Mile Sweepstakes Race, and made the winning prize $20,000, making it the highest paying sporting event in the world. It was a brilliant decision that almost immediately made the Indy 500 and the Brickyard the country's premier race and track. The first Indianapolis 500 was held on May 30th, 1911, with an estimated attendance of 85,000. While it was initially a good track for testing cars, racer Eddie Rickenbacker would say in 1946 that approximately 70% of all mechanical improvements originated on the Indianapolis Speedway. By the 1920s, most automakers had built their own proving grounds. Though he'd already made a name for himself, Carl was already working on a different project. Roads. Most of America's roads were in rough shape, paved with loose gravel or completely unimproved. It made driving long distances difficult, if not impossible. Some city roads were paved, but driving was often considered a hobby and not a necessity. If you wanted to travel across the country, you took a train. Carl advocated that good roads are cheaper than poor ones, and that a little money spent wisely goes further than all the thousands thrown annually into mud holes. He told Jim Allison that the automobile industry should be willing to finance a road across the country. Think what it would do for the American automobile. He sold the road as a way to sell cars and set about convincing every automaker he could find to support the project. His biggest target was Henry Ford, the most dominant factor in the automobile industry of today. Unfortunately, Ford wasn't interested. As long as private interests are willing to build good roads, the general public will not be very interested in building good roads for itself, said the Ford Motor Company Secretary Treasurer. Carl was still able to raise millions and settled on the name Lincoln Highway to honor the president. They began the Lincoln Highway Association to build a continuous improved highway from Atlantic to Pacific. The first section was completed in New Jersey and dedicated on December 13, 1913. Fisher did everything he could to promote the highway. The association publicized high-profile contributions, such as those made by Theodore Roosevelt, Thomas Edison, and current President Woodrow Wilson. They also publicized smaller donations, such as 14 cents from Native Alaskan children in Anvik, Alaska. Choosing the route would be the most difficult part. What was easier in the east, thanks to the density of roads, and the west good roads were scarce. Putting together a team to scout the western route, Fisher rode at the head of the Trailblazer Tour that included 17 cars and two trucks, as well as a newspaperman from the Hearst Syndicate and telegraph operators to publicize the tour. The tour was greeted enthusiastically in every town, but the journey was arduous and it took a month to get to San Francisco. The final route differed from the one the tour had taken to the chagrin of communities that had thought that they had been promised to stop on the highway. Dwight Eisenhower would follow much of the road on a difficult trip across the country in 1919, a journey which played a large role in his support of the interstate highway system during his presidency. Managing the many factors involved eventually made it clear that the automobile industry wouldn't be able to fund the road's construction. Ultimately, the association spent most of its money promoting the road, like building one-mile-long seedling sections and lobbying every level of government to support the road. Ultimately, the Lincoln Highway was never truly improved along its whole length until the building and maintenance of roads was taken over by the government and highways were given numbers instead of names. Much of the Lincoln Highway would become U.S. Route 30. In 1910, Carl bought a mansion in Miami, Florida. Florida was sparsely populated at the time, though winter resorts had already sprung up. It was then that Carl first saw the mangrove swamp-covered peninsula across the bay that would become Miami Beach. 
Joining with other buddies, Carl saw in the island the makings of a resort, although his wife Jane disagreed. What on earth could Carl possibly see in such a place, she wondered as she struggled through the mangroves. It was enormous work clearing the marshy land, and it had to then be filled with sand that Carl and partners dredged from the bay. They intended to dredge up six million cubic yards of what looked like sloppy cream of wheat. They built acres and acres of land this way, and then planted grasses to hold it down. He built himself a house there, promised to develop golf courses, hotels, and more. At first, the investment struggled to make money, which was part of his inspiration for yet another tremendous project, a highway from Michigan to Miami. Roads in the South were particularly awful thanks to local resistance, and Carl and the Dixie Highway Association fought to convince Southern governments that better roads would bring tourism and wealth. The road came together even more slowly and unevenly than the Lincoln Highway, but did inspire many Southern communities to begin to work to improve the roads. Eventually, the Dixie Highway would bring millions to Florida. After World War I, the Miami Beach boom really began in earnest. He had spent almost everything he had promoting and building the place, and in the 1920s, he earned it back. Carl managed a promotional boon when he managed to get President-elect Warren Harding to stop by his Flamingo Hotel. Carl was a major figure in the promotional image of Miami. In the middle of winter, he put up a big sign in New York City that said, It's June in Miami. By the mid-1920s, he was wealthier than ever before. With the boom came land speculators, which tempered enthusiasm for the state and slowed the flood of tourists. Carl had already moved on to a new project, this time on Long Island, where he had purchased a new summer home. He discovered Montauk, a 10,000-acre piece of the island, which he intended to turn into another fabulous retreat. He imagined a resort city with the charm of the old world. Carl spent lavishly. On paper, he was fabulously wealthy, and his investments were all paying out. In 1925, he and Jane were divorced, and his mother died. Carl did ironically started drinking when Prohibition began in 1920, and had suffered greatly when Carl and Jane's only child died, only 26 days old. He threw himself into Montauk, his Miami Beach at the north, and Jane remarried. Again, he faced criticism from friends. Why was he building a huge project if he didn't need more money? Just as he steam shovels throwing dirt and building things going up, Carl replied. And then, in 1926, the Great Miami Hurricane made landfall. It was the first serious hurricane in more than a decade to hit the area, and residents weren't prepared. The damage was bad, but the value of the land was hurt worse. Almost right after, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began. This was the beginning of the end for crazy Carl Fisher. He tried to keep Montauk afloat and lasted a few years on receipts from his investments, but sales were lousy, and by 1932, Montauk was in receivership. A year later, foreclosures hit his properties all over, and much of his fortune was gone. He ended up selling most of the rest of his property off and living on a salary from his friends that kept him comfortable, though no longer wealthy. In his life, he refused to name any of his large projects after himself and went through a great deal of effort to stay out of the limelight. Though he loved publicity, he wasn't looking to immortalize his own name. His wife Jane later said that he made millions, but it was all incidental. And he would often say, I just love to see the dirt fly. And he's since been recognized by the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the Automobile Hall of Fame. But due to his drinking, by 1938 he was facing ill health and large doctor bills. He died of a gastric hemorrhage on July 15, 1939. There's a memorial to him in Miami Beach with a bust that says, He carved a great city out of a jungle. And of course he did more than that, from selling automobiles their first headlights to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway to his highways. Carl Graham Fisher left a lasting impression on the world as we know it. If you want to learn more about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, visit their museum. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.